Hello, we're here today to talk about replacing the bypass and power supply filter capacitors as well as a power cord, the original equipment found in a 1959 Gibson GA5 guitar amplifier I bought uh, a month or so ago. So before we get to taking a look at what I did, let's take a look at what I started with. And over here, uh, we have a number of the original components. So this is the uh, 20 microfarad, 25 volt mini mite bypass capacitor. These are very common in amplifiers of this vintage. And given it's, this amp is at least 55 years old, uh, this capacitor, this electrolytic capacitor, has outlived its expected life. And continued use of this, even though it might sound okay, uh, continued use of this puts the user at risk of this uh, capacitor eventually shorting out and doing damage to the uh, inner workings of the amplifier. Similarly, here's the uh, original tri-cap as it's called, and you can see by the uh, text on the tri-capacitor, it's a spray capacitor, original equipment. It has uh, three capacitors built in, If this one body case, a 20 microfarad, a 10 microfarad, and another 10 microfarad. And you can see by the color-coded leads, the red is the 20, the blue and the yellow are 10 mics, and the black is the common. So again, 55-year-old electrolytic. Uh, based on previous measurements, this thing is probably running two to five times its uh, rated value after 50 plus years. So time for the electrolytics to go. Last but not least, here's the, I don't know if it's original, but here's the lamp cord, two-wire lamp cord that was in the amp when I got it. Uh, works fine. It's stiff. It's aged. You can feel that. But there's nothing wrong with it. It works fine. Uh, time to replace it, though, because uh, uh, any user that's operating the amplifier like this or any electronic or electrical device without a ground is uh, doing so uh, at great personal risk. Uh, this amplifier uh, does present lethal voltages, um, so it's really smart to uh, get away from the two-wire and go with a three-wire grounded approach. So let's take a look. You know, what, do, what do we do here and what are the results? So first of all, Looking at this uh, pair here of a resistor and capacitor, that's the R11 470 ohm resistor with a C4, a 20 microfarad, 50 volt replacement. So I upgraded the voltage here. The ESR goes up negligibly. And besides, this is not uh, uh, part of the tone circuit. It will not affect uh, the overall tone or sound of the amp at all, as long as it's the same rated value. Uh, the 470 ohm resistor original I replaced uh, with this uh, carbon composition, uh, basically the same vintage, same type, uh, same value. Uh, the only difference is the original had a uh, lacked a tolerance band, the fourth band here, which means that the original resistor had no tolerance, actually it had 20 percent tolerance. This one has 10 percent tolerance. Similarly here on this group, this is R3 and C1, a 2.2 K ohm resistor with that same 20 microfarad Sprague Atom cap uh, was replaced with um, uh, with the, with the Sprague Atom and the modern carbon comp, sorry. And then here you can see where uh, each of the exposed leads uh, has been uh, coated with a shrink tube uh, to prevent any kind of sort of shorting that might might occur. So that's just good good sort of uh, uh, methodology. And and I likewise I tried to put these for sort of a cosmetics aesthetics. Uh, this this pair is at a 90 degree angle to this pair, so it, it all overall looks nice. Moving on to the tri-cap, the replacement of the tri-cap. So here is a, uh, is a Sprague Atom, blue in color, 20 microfarad, a 500 volt capacitor that was a voltage upgrade to the 450 volt T, uh, that was present in the amp. This is a Sprague TVA1906. Uh, below it are two Sprague Atoms, uh, TVA1705s. That's a 10 microfarad, 450 volt. Um, here on this side, uh, the three common leads were bundled together, created a, a mecha, ground mecha, and then connected the original black common lead to this point here. Uh, any of the exposed leads, again, have been shrink-wrapped to uh, provide protection. On the positive end of the capacitor, you can see the original wires, the blue, the red, and the yellow, each going to the proper capacitor, uh, C5, C6, and C7, uh, to grab the 10 10, 10, and 20 microfarad, respectively, uh, points of that, I'll call it a new sort of stack. Um, also, you'll observe that on this end, here where the shrink tube joins the actual wire, 
uh, maybe about a quarter to a half inch area. That's the only part of this tubing that was actually heat treated to shrink it. The rest is in its sort of original natural state. Uh, it's loosely uh, wrapped around the weed. That way, if there's any need to repair, like the solder joint is right here about midpoint, um, you could use a knife to cut this away, expose the joint without having to sort of carve away all that uh, shrink tubing. And that's true on each of the uh, three leads there. Below the stack of capacitors, those three caps, you'll see this brown material uh, right against the chassis. That's a capped on dielectric. It's a, it's a tape with adhesive backing that has been attached to the uh, chassis directly. Uh, one mil capped on provides, uh, has a material property of 500 volts breakdown. So um, if there's any, uh, this capacitor stack becomes loose, um, or any of these leads were to be deflected or pushed down towards the chassis, they would touch the cap down and prevent them from shorting to what is now held. The chassis is now held at, uh, at uh, ground. So no shorting, no issues uh, electrically. To get it to stay in place, I cut a window in the cap down to size to fit in these uh, cable tie hold downs which again are have a pressure sensitive adhesive on the back of them and attach directly to the chassis after being cleaned with isopropyl alcohol. Then I put the cable ties through, uh, cinched them up nice and tight, and as a last bit to make sure they're mechanically sound, um, I put in some of the silicone adhesive here and here to lock the cables and ties in place, and it is very firmly and snugly attached. Um, I forgot to mention that before uh, attaching the uh, caps down, I uh, used a syringe to fill the cavity uh, in this area at the center of the three capacitors and filled it until the point that the adhesive oozed out to form a fillet along these long axes on each of the three interfaces where the capacitors join. That means the capacitors are very solidly held together and by these cable ties um, sort of held in place you can actually pick up the chassis and shake it around it's so firmly attached there and I'm holding the chassis and I'm moving the caps and you can barely move them and they're not loose in any fashion so this isn't going anywhere. Over here on this end what we're looking at here is the power cord so it's a three wire uh, computer monitor cord I snipped the end off, ran it through a brand new grommet uh, that is located here in the chassis. Didn't have to drill out the hole, didn't have to drill out the chassis at all. And you can't really see it here too well, but there's another grommet of a smaller diameter uh, and that and has a cable tie uh, clamped around it that keeps the cable from slipping through the chassis if, if force is applied to the cable in a pulling direction and that keeps all this cable in place. Likewise on the other side is a similar grommet and cable tie affair to keep from pushing the cable through the chassis and causing stress uh, where its solder attaches to the, to the correct points in the circuit. Lastly, there's a connector here that's been crimped to the green lead, soldered for maximum electrical conducti conductivity, and then held in place by a nut attached to the uh, transformer chassis screw. So that's it. I hope this helps. If you're thinking about restoring one of these amps, uh, maybe this is some good guidance. Good luck.